Welcome to the Serial Talker Podcast. I'm Peter Von Gom. And whoa, we got a doozy for you today. I received an anonymous email from a person in America who has insider information about a brazen Brinks armored robbery that took place in Rochester, New York, back in the 90s. This person was closely acquainted with one of the perps and asked me not to disclose their name. And, of course, I will respect that. Now, this wasn't any ordinary Brinks robbery. It is a very colorful cast of characters that play pivotal roles in this historic heist. An IRA militant, an ex-cop, a professional boxer, and, are you sitting, a Catholic priest. Bless you, Father, for this time you have sinned. In this episode of the Serial Talker podcast, we're going to unpack the half-truths, false starts, and dead ends. A nicely blended mix of the IRA, the Catholic Church, a prize fighter, and a retired beat cop. Be sure and stick around for the end of this story, where there is a very interesting twist. A first-hand account from our informant that makes this already unbelievable story even more extraordinary. Let's get into it, shall we? It was a freezing night in January 1993 when masked gunmen walked through the laughably lax security at the Rochester Brinks Depot, tied up the guards, and made off with nearly seven and a half million bucks. The characters that play out in this extraordinary story need a proper introduction, beginning with the idea man, Sam Miller. Sam Miller is an obstinate, laconic, and hard-nosed Belfast provo slang for provisional Irish Republican army. He was in Derry on Bloody Sunday as a 16-year-old. Bloody Sunday, of course, refers to the demonstrations by Roman Catholic civil rights supporters that went violent when British paratroopers opened fire back in 1972. Miller joined the IRA shortly after this. The following year, he was the first person to be sentenced to three years in prison for being a member of the IRA. He got out in 1975, but was back in for a 10-year stint by 1976, caught with explosives in central Belfast. Fresh from prison in 1983, Miller was introduced to Tom O'Connor. He also plays a role in this. He was on a tour of his parents' native Ireland. A year later, after Miller was refused a U.S. visa because of his criminal background, O'Connor helped smuggle him into the U.S., Miller settled in New York, where he got a job as a croupier, working for Irish mafia types in the city's illegal casinos. He would remove the money from the gambling dens and spirit it away on a motorcycle, so that if the cops raided them, there would be less cash on hand and criminal charges would be lower. He was good at the business and quickly rose through the ranks. He held a variety of jobs, including as an elevator operator in Manhattan, A week after the Brinks heist, he quit his job. Enter the cop, Tom O'Connor, Brinks security guard and close acquaintance of our anonymous informant. O'Connor was a former New York beat cop and detective with a 20-year police career, unremarkable but unblemished. After his retirement from the force, O'Connor went to work as a security guard at Rochester's Genesee Brewing Company, one of the nation's oldest breweries. A colleague there, Damian McClinton, was fatally shot one day while on the job. O'Connor was never publicly identified as a suspect in the killing, and the crime was never solved. However, some homicide investigators thought he knew more than he was willing to tell. McClinton, after all, was in a serious relationship with O'Connor's ex-girlfriend. And O'Connor's alibi seemed shaky, according to a fellow cop and friend. Sometime in the 1980s, O'Connor became active in Irish Northern Aid, NORAID, a U.S. group that collects money for families of prisoners caught in Northern Ireland's quarter century of political and religious violence. The U.S. and British governments contend NORAID is an arms smuggling agent of the IRA. The Catholic Priest, Father Patrick Maloney Father Maloney met Sam Miller at a wake in New York City in the early 90s. Both being of a common, proud Irish fabric, they became friends. Maloney, a slight man with a short gray beard and glasses, 
emigrated from Ireland in 1955, and, inspired by the Catholic activist and anarchist Dorothy Day, began his ministry for the poor in the blighted East Village. He's a member of an ancient Eastern Catholic Church with roots in early Christianity in the Middle East, known as the Melkites. He's spent decades working with tough Lower East Side gang members, opening his doors to them, giving them a bed at his youth shelter, the Bonita's House, connecting them with constructive activities like dances as an alternative to the streets. As tough as those he shelters, on one occasion protesters evading police sought refuge inside St. Bridget's Church. As a cop tried to get inside, Father Pat punched him square in the face and knocked him down. Prior to the Brinks heist, Father Maloney almost went to jail on another occasion. His brother, John, was an international shipper who was also running guns to the IRA. When one of John's ships docked in Ireland in 1982, he and Father Pat were met by law enforcement upon opening a box of Armalite machine guns on board. Armalites are like an Uzi, Father Pat explains. Favorite weapon of the IRA, compact, deadly, and quick. For the gun-running bust, Father Maloney got off. His brother John served three years in prison. Ronnie Gibbons, the Boxer Boxer Ronnie Gibbons had a boxing boutique in Greenwich Village on 6th Avenue and called Muhammad Ali and Jake LaMotta acquaintances. He was wiry and muscular, a disciplined boxer whose technique and intelligence in the ring had boxing aficionados thinking he could fight his way to the top of the super welterweight ranks. He worked a side job with Sam Miller, also as a croupier in the underground casinos. They were in charge of the gaming tables, gathering in and paying out money. He was a good egg, colorful, hated drug dealers. Ronnie Gibbons had been in on the planning of the heist, but ultimately didn't help carry it out. However, he still felt an entitlement to some of the booty. More on that coming later. Now that we have a little background on the characters in this story, let's get into the meat of it. To his neighbors in Jackson Heights in the early 90s, Sam Miller was known as a stoic family man. He drove an old minivan and had a comic book store near the family's apartment on 24th Avenue near LaGuardia Airport in Queens. He was a really private guy. I thought he was a police officer or in the security business or something, says Pete Wong, a retired waiter who lived downstairs from Miller along with his wife and three kids. So one day late in 1993, Mr. Wong was surprised when federal agents swarmed the building and arrested Sam Miller. When I heard later that he was part of a bank robbery for seven million bucks, I couldn't believe it, recalled Mr. Wong, who later learned that those agents arrested his mild-mannered neighbor in connection with a brazen holdup of a Brinks armored depot in Rochester, authorities then calling it one of the largest armored car robberies ever in the United States. Miller's neighbors also learned that he was a former Irish Republican Army rebel who had served eight years in the notorious prison known as Long Kesh. He was also known to go on lengthy hunger strikes while incarcerated. But Sam Miller's hardened IRA history had a flip side. He loved the fantastical world of comic books, so much so that he opened a comic book shop in Queens with his girlfriend Bernadette, KAC Comics. Comics played a huge part of his life. As a child, most of his reading was done outside of school, and most of that was comics. It was all about escapism. But the one thing he couldn't escape were the charges brought against him by the FBI. The year was 1986. Seeking a new lease on life after release from prison, Miller and his then-girlfriend, Bernadette, were smuggled illegally into the United States by a friend, Tom O'Connor. They settled in New York City. O'Connor, a retired cop, was working security part-time at a Brinks Armored Depot in Rochester, New York. After living in the States for about a year, Tom O'Connor invited Miller up to Rochester. O'Connor wondered if maybe Miller fancied a job at the firm, away from the dodgy casinos. Miller was interested in the job, all right, but a different job to the one O'Connor had envisaged. Miller was dumbstruck by the lack of security. The doors were held open with pencils. Pizza guys were coming and going, 
and the security guys were saying, just leave them there. And all that millions and millions of dollars was just sitting around. If he hadn't seen the inside of the Brinks Armored Depot, he never would have thought about it. But this opportunity was too good to pass up. Something had to be done. It was 1987, and Miller hatched a plan. One as basic as they come. He and his boxing friend, Ronnie Gibbons, would drive to Brinks and Rochester from New York City, hold up the security guards, and drive back to New York with the loot. Simple. But Gibbons chickened out en route to Rochester in 1987, and the robbery was aborted, much to Miller's fury. Six years passed. In January 1993, he and another friend from the casinos, Marco, an Italian-American veteran of the Gulf War, drove back along the route. Marco was game. When they got to Brinks, the first person they held at gunpoint was O'Connor. The other guards put up little resistance, apart from one who was tempted to draw his gun until the sound of Miller pulling back the hammer of his weapon snapped him back to the real world. The masked gunman forced O'Connor's co-workers to the floor of the vault room, bound them hand and foot, and their heads were covered with empty money bags. O'Connor was forced to go with the robbers. Later, O'Connor's co-workers told FBI agents that they heard what sounded like the opening and closing of a sliding door from a minivan. It took only a few minutes to handcuff the guards, another minute to get their van into the depot, and then they began loading their vehicle with bags and bags and bags of cash. But instead of zooming off into the night in their getaway car, the engine began to overheat and belched black smoke. Incipient panic commenced. Marco reasoned what was wrong. Too much weight. The getaway car was laden with hundreds and hundreds of pounds of cash. They had no choice. They had to discard some of that cash. They began tossing sacks of money out of the van, three to four million dollars worth, before the engine began to function properly again. And away they went, back to New York City, taking O'Connor with them as a hostage, but releasing him en route. O'Connor was found outside a pub he frequented. How convenient. He told authorities he had been abducted. When questioned, the other two guards passed polygraph tests and cooperated with police. Federal authorities immediately called the crime a possible terrorist act carried out to fund the IRA's campaign against the British in Northern Ireland. But investigators lacked hard evidence, and the three suspects offered little cooperation. O'Connor refused to help, and after four days, provided a signed deposition to investigators, who became convinced it was riddled with falsehoods. O'Connor told investigators the robbers put a knit hat over his face after they overpowered and disarmed him, even though a knit hat is not really an effective blindfold. He told authorities the robbers also ordered him to answer the depot's phone and let in anyone at the door. The ex-policeman said he was placed in a large moving van with an overhead door, even though the guard's statements about the minivan and tire tracks at the scene indicated the getaway car was a minivan. FBI agents quickly concluded that the robbery was an inside job and that O'Connor was the chief suspect, especially after his refusal of the polygraph test. A review of motor vehicle records revealed that Miller's girlfriend, Bernadette, owned a minivan. FBI agents found that she and Miller were living together in New York City. And then the surveillance began. On the second day, agents say they saw Miller discard two tires with markings similar to those found at the depot. Agents also said that Miller opened a bank account with $25,000 and began buying money orders using aliases. He took a vacation to Florida. His girlfriend and another woman went to Hawaii. Those trips were paid with cash. Miller's share of the heist was about $3.5 million. He stashed it first in his garage, then in an apartment in New York that had a fire escape ladder right next to the window, always kept open. The pile of cash was about 8 feet by 8 feet square 
and reached the ceiling. He became a big spender in his queen's neighborhood, splurging on those vacations, but also opening a comic book shop and buying rare editions, KAC comics and collectibles, was a fantasy world Miller could get lost in. Comics appealed to him. It was also a great way to launder the money. There was money, money everywhere. But the big problem was what to do with it all. This brings our Catholic priest, Father Patrick Maloney, into this complex tale. Being acquainted with Father Maloney, Miller was impressed that he had worked with down and outs in New York for decades. Miller approached him for help, and the priest found him an apartment where he stored the loot. Father Maloney had long kept safe houses across the city, secret apartments that he offered as refuges to Irish Republicans on the lam and other political fugitives, as well as undocumented immigrants. The apartment was located in New York's Stuyvesant town. And unfortunately, and unknown to Miller, the apartment belonged to Charles McCormick, an Irish-American teacher who innocently got caught up in this weird story. He was later cleared of any wrongdoing, as he had no knowledge of what was going on in his apartment. One day, Father Maloney entered the apartment, only to find Miller counting a mountain of cash by hand, with bills stacked nearly to the ceiling. Sam, I need this money out of here. I can't risk anything happening, Father Maloney said. He even bought Sam Miller an electric cash counter, which later became an exhibit at the trial and is now the priest's memento. Evidence tag still attached. Miller continued his spending spree using exclusively Andy Jackson's $20 bills, the denomination of the stolen Brinks cash, even going so far as to buying a brand new Ford Explorer to replace the minivan. He paid with cash in Father Maloney's name. Federal agents tailing Miller wound up connecting the license plates to the priest. The surveillance continued, and the feds were piecing everything together and closing in. The priest being very well connected to the underworld and the upper world, as it was part of his job, was tipped off by his connections that federal agents were watching Miller in his Queen's neighborhood. Maloney urged Miller to curtail his spending, but Sam Miller ignored the warnings. Investigators suspected Father Maloney knew more about the robbery than he let on, as, unbeknownst to the priest, federal agents had surveillance tapes showing him exiting the Stuyvesant Town apartment, carrying duffel bags that investigators believed were filled with cash. This and other evidence was enough to grant an arrest warrant for Tom O'Connor, Father Patrick Maloney, Sam Miller, and the Irish-American teacher, Charles McCormick, that owned the apartment. McCormick was quickly cleared of any wrongdoing, and Tom O'Connor was acquitted as there wasn't enough solid evidence to convict him. Father Maloney's bail was set at $1 million by a judge who said it would take a miracle to raise it. Father Maloney replied with characteristic bravado, Judge, I'm in the business of miracles, and went on to raise bail and contributions in a matter of days. During the seven-week trial of Sam Miller and Father Maloney in Rochester in late 1994, the money from the Stuyvesant Town apartment became key evidence against them. Investigators recovered $168,000 in cash from a safe in Father Maloney's Bonitas house and found an empty safe in a home that he kept in Florida. During surveillance, they also observed the priest and Sam Miller house hunting together in Westchester County after the robbery putting into question whether Father Pat was as much of a victim as he said he was. In the end, Sam Miller and Father Maloney were convicted only of possessing cash from the robbery. The priest was never charged with planning or executing the robbery and has long maintained his innocence. He said he never profited and assumed that Miller's pile of cash was linked to his casino work, with Miller telling him not to worry about it. Father Maloney felt Sam should have exonerated him from the beginning. Maloney claimed the money in the Bonitas house safe belonged to a group of undocumented immigrants who entrusted the priest to safeguard the cash as their informal credit union because they were afraid to use banks. 
and insisted that he was as innocent as the Lamb of God in the Brinks case. However, he volunteered little information to investigators and refused to testify at trial, his reasoning being, as a priest, he's a trusted confidant to some rough characters and looks dimly on spilling information about others, his father having taught him that the only good rat is a dead rat. Father Maloney served five years in federal prison in Pennsylvania. His involvement in the case seemed to burnish his heroic image as a rebel priest in the East Village, where Free Father Pat graffiti tags, bumper stickers, and signs could be seen during his incarceration. That sentiment spilled over into the nuns of his parish that sent Sam Miller angry notes of disgust. How dare he implicate their dear Father Maloney? Sam Miller served four years and was allowed to complete his term in an Irish prison under a larger inmate transfer program arranged during President Bill Clinton's administration. Whatever happened to the boxer Ronnie Gibbons, you ask? Well, this is how that piece of the whole saga unfolded. Some time after the Brinks heist, Gibbons had confided in his friends that he had planned the robbery along with Sam Miller and Tom O'Connor from the beginning, but had backed out because they planned to use guns in the stick-up. After the heist and arrests, Gibbons was furious with Tom O'Connor, who he felt had fingered the other men in the scheme and kept most of the Brinks' cash for himself, having walked scot-free. Gibbons decided to head upstate to Rochester to confront O'Connor. He borrowed a green Toyota from friends for the trip. Clearly concerned about what may go down, he told them that if he didn't return to get in touch with his brother. And, well, they got in touch with his brother. He was never seen alive again. The car was found abandoned in an Applebee's parking lot in upstate New York. Later, in 1999, dismembered body parts began washing up on the shores of Lake Ontario. First, a torso, and then a leg. The remains went unidentified until 2011, when a positive DNA match was made with Ronnie Gibbons. I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, I was contacted anonymously by someone regarding this historic crime that has compelling insider knowledge of the case, and that perhaps isn't even known by the authorities. Many of the characters in this case have since passed on, including Tom O'Connor, a close acquaintance of our contact, and the only one involved in the Brinks heist to have eluded any prosecution. What you're about to hear hasn't been heard before by anyone, and puts a dazzling spin on this extraordinary tale. This is what they had to say. Back in 1993, I found myself smack in the middle of this story, and because of many people I knew, I couldn't speak to anyone about it. Tom O'Connor and I knew each other many years before the robbery because of common Irish friends we ran with in our boating community. Over the years, I began to piece together that some of these folks were deeply involved with the IRA, something that I wanted nothing to do with, and began to distance myself from them. In the late night on the day the robbery happened, I saw Tom O'Connor getting off a boat at the public dock on the Genesee River, where I also had a boat moored. We said hello to each other, and off he went towards his home, just a few blocks away. There was nothing out of the ordinary, with the exception of the time of day Tom was there, late night, and I had never seen that boat that he was getting off of. We were a tight-knit group back then, and we were all well acquainted with who was who and who owned what boat. When the boat left, it roared out of there at full speed, headed due north, a direct line to Toronto, Canada, two and a half hours away. In hindsight, what's mind-numbingly brazen about this is right next door is the U.S. Coast Guard complex, ballsy or extremely careless, I'm not sure. By the next morning, the inquiries and manhunt was underway. I was visited by the authorities. Evidently, I was seen at the mooring that night by a local police cruiser, and they had come to ask me about Tom and what I'd seen. I told them what I saw, and that was that. There are many, many details 
that I simply can't share, as it could implicate me in this drama. But one other bit that hangs like a shadow is the Roman Catholic Church's involvement. It was known by a handful of us that Tom O'Connor was deeply involved, along with others, in smuggling money and people in and out of Ireland and other places through the local Catholic Church. Those people were given U.S. citizenship and papers, including Sam Miller. For the safety of my family, including my father, I had to share information only I was privy to, to stress the dangers inherent around us. They were in disbelief at first. Employees needed to be let go from our family business due to unsavory ties to the Rochester IRA. When the legal assistant's fiancé of our inner circle was shot dead late one night at his job, it became all too real. In the span of 14 months, 17 close family members died, the FBI investigating each one for their cause. I took this as my cue loud and clear. I sold my business and began a quiet retirement. It's been well over 25 years, and a lot of people have passed on. I still hear and see things that I share with people that need to know. But I'm still not entirely comfortable, and I definitely don't want to rock any boats. I'll leave you with this. On the night of Tom O'Connor's acquittal of the charges in the Brinks robbery, we were all hanging out with Tom and his fiancée, Barb, after hours at a place we frequented. The bar owner asked him pointedly, Did you do it, Tom? Just come clean, they can't try you twice. Tom looked at me and smiled and said, You never said anything? I replied, No, Tom, who would have believed me? He and I had never spoken together of the event until that night. Tom asked how long I knew and I told him from the beginning. He assumed correctly I knew because of our common Irish friends. I asked if the homeland, Ireland, got the cash, and his response was, after everyone's payout. Tom said he got a third of the cut. As to where did he hide his share of the cash? Well, to quote Tom, he winked at me and said, How did you like that tear garden we put in last year? Now that Tom has passed on and many other people involved are gone, I can speak to you about it. But still, to this day, I don't know how a lot of it never became public. But I can say, I did quietly watch a lot of the dominoes fall. Man, I am just blown away by this story. This heist of the Brinks Armored Depot is one of the biggest in American history. And the narrative behind it is just so extraordinary. And I'm much indebted to the person who reached out to me to introduce, firstly, this story and also share their very intimate knowledge about the case and the characters that were front and center. You may be wondering about those that are still living. Well, Sam Miller is now a playwright and novelist living in Belfast with his family. His best-selling and award-winning memoir, On the Brinks, is the full story of the Brinks armored heist. I would say that is very good reading. He also has a series of fictional novels chronicling the life and times of his fictional hard man, private investigator Carl Kane. As for Father Patrick Maloney, he is still operating his charitable halfway house in Manhattan. Tom O'Connor died in 2013 at age 74, without serving one day in jail. In addition to the murder of Ronnie Gibbons, O'Connor had also been a suspect in another unsolved Rochester homicide. No one seems to know for sure how much of the missing $5 million from the Brinks robbery ended up in the hands of the IRA, but psst, I think we know some did. Thanks so much for listening to the Serial Talker podcast. It is my pleasure to bring these to you each week. If you like these kinds of podcasts, please consider subscribing to the channel. And if you have a true compelling story you would like me to consider reading, please send it on. Those details are in the description. If you would like to help support the production of this podcast, you could always buy me a cup of coffee. Those details are also in the description. And finally, if you think your friends would be interested in the Serial Talker podcast, please share it. Thanks so much, guys. We'll see you again next week. Ciao for now.